it's wonderful to have you all here today. And because this is a, a women's session, they've given me the honor of introducing the, the event. So I'm really pleased to be doing that as part of the executive of the European Cancers Association. So I'm going to tell you about the European Cancers Association very briefly. It's an independent organization established in the United Kingdom in 2012. It's a framework for cancers, prayer leaders, and interested lay people across the spectrum of Jewish worship to engage in dialogue, training, and profile raising to ensure that the beautiful and unique music of Jewish prayer continues to enhance synagogue services for future generations. ECA arranges conventions in UK and European cities, presenting Zoom series, The Voice of the Cantor, where we're hearing what it's really like. Uh, its academic wing presents international conferences on Jewish prayer in partnership with universities around the world. Our esteemed moderator presenter today is Russell Grossman. Uh, Russell is a graduate of London's Jews College. He's been Chazan at High Holidays for nearly 40 years, the last 13 at Gifnock Synagogue in Glasgow. Uh, Russell presented the program for the recent European Cantus Convention in Hanover in January 2020. He's also a webmaster, Facebook monitor, a very, very excellent uh, member of our executive. So he's all our moderator today. Over to you, Russell. Okay, Geraldine, thank you very much. So uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for coming. This is the last in our series of 11 presentations focusing on the voice of the cantor. Um, there's been no singing in any of these sessions. Instead, we've focused instead on the joys and the fears of the Jewish prayer leader across the world today. And over the series, we've been privileged to hear from, in fact, no less than 42 cantors, rabbis, prayer leaders, musical directors and musicologists. And we've covered topics ranging from the difference between European and North American practice, the curved ball of the pandemic, what Ashkenazi cantors can learn from Sephardi ones, the relevance of Nusach, the relevance of a shul choir. Um, and last week we looked at a renaissance of the cantorate in Europe. And tonight we're continuing the second uh, of our two sessions looking at the future of cantorial art. And this one is looking at the rise of the female cantor. So I'm absolutely delighted to, to welcome a very distinguished panel this evening uh, to examine the opportunities and challenges for female cantors, uh, obviously in progressive synagogues uh, in the UK, in Europe and in Israel, and in a societal framework of greater diversity and inclusion. And I will very briefly introduce each of the panellists and then I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves uh, a little bit more fully. Cantor Tamara Wolfson was born and raised in New York and from a young age was inspired by the example of her cantor, uh, Jacob Mendelssohn. And you will remember if you were there at the session that we had a couple of weeks ago uh, that uh, Jackie Mendelssohn was one of our panellists. After receiving her bachelor's degree in Jewish studies from American Jewish University in Los Angeles, Tamara began her cantorial studies at the Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music at the Hebrew Union College. And in fact, HUC is one of the things that binds together four of our panellists this evening. After her ordination in May 2018, Tamara moved to the UK, where she served as cantor of the Ark Liberal Synagogue and a spiritual leader of Cahilla, North London. She currently serves as cantor of Aylith Reform Synagogue in Northwest London. Shani Ben Or is from Jerusalem and is well on her way to become the first Israeli Reform ordained cantor. Her home congregation is Gehilat Kolhan and Shama in Jerusalem. She served in cantorial roles in Israel and around the world, and as a cantorial soloist of the United Jewish Congregation in Hong Kong and as student cantor of Central Synagogue in New York. Shani has a, an MA in Jewish Pluralistic Studies from Ono Academic College and taught in various Bote Midrashim in Israel. She is also an active member of the Israel Movement for Reform and Progressive Judaism. Cantor Jackie Chernot is the first woman in the UK to be ordained as a Chazan. She's the founder and director of studies of the European Academy for Jewish Liturgy, an academy without walls as it's styled, teaching inspired leaders of synagogue prayer around the world. She writes and lectures on Jewish religious issues, in particular on liturgical studies. 
She received cantorial ordination in 2006 from Rabbi Dr. Martin Cooper, Chazan Sol Zim, who I see is here again with us this evening, and Chazan Ken Cohen at the Academy for Jewish Religion, a pluralist rabbinical and cantorial school in New York. Cantor Zoe Jacobs was the first ordained reformed cantor in the UK. She first fell in love with Jewish music as a participant at the Finchley Reform Synagogue Summer Scheme and then later on at the Reform Synagogue Youth's Netzer's Summer Camps. Later in New York, she learned about the art of song leading and then more formally for five years at HUC where she was ordained in 2009. And then finally, Cantor Dan Singer was born and raised in Wisconsin and now serves Stephen Wise Free Synagogue in Manhattan. He has degrees in music and mass communications from the University of Wisconsin, uh, vocal performance from the University of Michigan, sacred music and cantorial ordination from HUC and performing arts administration from New York University. He served Stephen Wise Free Synagogue in New York City for over a decade. So that's a kind of potted potted bio of each of our um, cantors and student cantor this evening and I just want to uh, as I indicated just go to each of them for about three minutes uh, expounding on that bio and particularly asking you what what interested you in liturgical music and specifically uh, also maybe along the way what were some of the challenges and opportunities that you came across um, and I'm going to go first to Cantor Tamara. Um, hi everyone, it's lovely to be here uh, and to be with all of you, so many of my um, mentors and teachers as well. Um, it's really wonderful. Um, I, uh, as you heard, grew up in New York at Temple Israel Center of White Plains. Uh, and my mentor was, as you heard, uh, cantor Jackie Mendelssohn, who um, really empowered women to be on the bima with him, um, not just duetting with him, um, but singing the chazanut that he sang. And so I grew up from the age of 13, really immersing myself in a chazanut um, with absolutely no barriers uh, to my performance of an embrace of chazanut, uh, which really inspired me um, to see a place for myself on the bima, singing traditional nusach and chazanut, which I have made um, a real cornerstone of my cantorial career. Um, at HUC, we are very privileged to learn um, across the gamut of Jewish liturgical music, uh, from the more traditional to the more contemporary. Uh, and I feel very blessed to be a, a female cantor, to be a cantor in this day and age. Uh, I think we're uh, operating at a really exciting time. Uh, and I love the fact that we have so many colleagues who are continuing to shape the cantorial conversation. Uh, so not much more I can offer by way of introduction that Russell didn't already mention. Uh, and I look forward to the conversation tonight. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Cantor Tamara. Cantor Jackie, uh, what's, uh, what's the score from your point of view in terms of what interested you, who your mentors and teachers were, and again, some of the challenges and maybe opportunities you've encountered along the way? Oh, there's so many because I'm very old, so I've gone through a lot. Um, I grew up in an Orthodox shul as a woman with no voice. Um, and I was impassioned about Jewish studies, about music and Jewish music and liturgical music and the shawl and the sounds of shawl. And that's what has carried my soul throughout my life, really. Um, I didn't come to the Cantorate until I was well over 60. I'd been studying with Orthodox uh, cantors in this country who couldn't let it be known that they were teaching me, otherwise they would have uh, jeopardized their livelihoods and it was uh, terrible. So, uh, you know, uh, I found as well, um, round about 1980 when we founded the Masorati or conservative movement in this country, that, uh, you know, we wanted to preserve the orth not orthodox, it's not all it's the traditional liturgy, and I'm passionate about Nusach Atfila. And, and the guys who were uh, uh, singing, we nobody could afford to pay a cantor, you see. But this is the whole thing uh, about the cantorate um, outside. Now, with the reform movement, it's fantastic because, you know, my lovely colleagues, Zoe and Tamara, and uh, other uh, uh, cantors are coming forward now and, and being employed uh, it, there are very few people who can find um, um, 
jobs, if you know what I mean. So uh, the men who were who were leading the services, I found it. it, it, it I found uh, you know I wanted to teach them, and because with the wonderful help of one of my teachers, uh, Alexander Knapp, who I think is here, um, I managed to uh, do some studies. Uh, in ethnomusicology that interested me and uh, you know then I, I, I decided I, I had to form a, a teaching facility because I've been doing it and, and I you know I'm, I'm passionate about Nusach it's the it, it's not so much for me the cantorial style of old that is not what people are looking for in the kind of uh, shawl that I'm in uh, and even even in the mainstream United Synagogue, you haven't got the opportunity to do those big pieces, except maybe on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur or something like that. So I uh, I, I wanted to to form this teaching facility, and therefore I decided to get some form of ordination because you know there weren't any women doing this and they point the finger you know, what does she know she's only a woman and i found the blessing it was purely by chance the blessing of the uh, academy for jewish religion in new york where then i came under the wings of my beloved teacher Hazan Solzin, who i can see here in my, on my screen, which is wonderful. Uh, he's a blessing. Well, all my teachers are a blessing and I've had very many of them. But so, Sol gave me something uh, that indescribable, really. I, I remember uh, um, uh, looking at him and saying, I need to get into your head uh, because he composes things that, that congregations need want especially in the in the traditional setting in the so, so jackie i want to i want to come on to some of the some of the excellent topics that you've mentioned there uh, yeah. a little bit later on but just so that we can get a pin a pen picture of each of our panelists i'm going to if you don't mind i'm going to move on to dan now um and dan ask you a similar opening question about you know what 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 spurred you to get on uh, into the um, liturgical approach that you did what what has got you going? What are the challenges been, etc.? Um, so my name is Dan Singer. I am originally from northern Wisconsin, where the Jewish population there is next to none. Uh, my synagogue closed down when I was a kid, uh, before my bar mitzvah age. Uh, I come from a mixed marriage between an Israeli kibbutznik, uh, a left-wing anti-religious kibbutz, uh, uh, with a father who was raised in an Orthodox shul in Detroit. Uh, and, uh, you know, that produces, I guess, a reform canter uh, because I have music on both sides of my family. My mother's father was a violinist. Her grandfather was a chazan in Duisburg and a rabbi in Duisburg. Um, you know, we have religion. Uh, also, I discovered this last year. We have uh, a long line of singer family in, uh, I just discovered in uh, Panavis in uh, Lithuania, the long line of rabbis and cantors um, that I just just learned about. Uh, my journey took me from, uh, I went to graduate school at University of Michigan, studied opera, um, and there I met a uh, Hazan uh, cantor, Stephen Dubov, Alav HaShalom, who welcomed me in uh, extremely warmly into the Jewish community and the synagogue there. I had no model of a rabbi or cantor or services growing up because I didn't have a synagogue in Superior, Wisconsin. but. Um, uh, you know, I, I learned on the job and I ended up applying for cantorial school uh, not long thereafter because he was announcing from the pulpit, Danny Singer is going to be going to cantorial school. And I had not made that decision myself, but uh, the community made that for me. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I fulfilled that, uh, that promise. And uh, my journey into the cantor really was decided at uh, the passing of my father. Uh, he died uh, when I was uh, in cantorial school at the end of, uh, sorry, at the end of uh, my master's at University of Michigan. And I had promised him to become a bar mitzvah uh, uh, when I was a kid. Uh, and I ended up uh, doing that at the age of 23 uh, with cantor Stephen Dubov. And that really launched uh, my cantorial uh, pursuits. 
uh, brought me to uh, this liturgical pursuit that we're doing. I ended up uh, at HUC. I went through the program. I ended up at uh, Stephen Wise Free Synagogue, which is the first congregation to hire a woman rabbi, uh, and uh, probably the first Manhattan congregation to feature a female cantor. Uh, and so uh, it's really an honor that I was picked for this panel. Uh, I, really, I really just am deeply honored to be included in this. Uh, and I just want to say, you know, I, I'm coming at this from an outside perspective as somebody who didn't have a synagogue growing up. Uh, and so I feel like my music and that I, I write a lot of music because, as I was mentioning before this began, I don't feel like a lot of the traditional uh, Ashkenazi Chazanut uh, from, you know, the, the past 200 years is necessarily written for my voice as a low-voiced person. So I do write a lot of my own music. Um, and I feature a lot of Nusach, as uh, Jack and Jackie was saying. So um, I'm looking forward to this discussion, and um, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. So, Shani, you're, you're still at HUC. Um, how is the journey looking for you so far? Very exciting. I'm finishing. I just finished my last semester uh, of about six years, depending when you, <laughs> depending when you start to count. Um, I have to say it's a, a, a big kavod. Uh, to be here. I see so many people that are part of my journey um, and that really brought me to this point. Um, but I can say that the first uh, cantorial figure that I met as a very, very young toddler was actually a rabbi. Uh, my rabbi Levi and Kate Apkor Neshama was the closest thing that I had in Israel to a cantor. He's a very talented shliach tzibur. In my congregation, I wouldn't say, I don't like the word um, that was highly participatory, because I think that you also participate when you're listening to a fantastic piece of Chazanot, just like when Cantor Tamara Wolfson sang in school and I got to hear her, for instance. Um, but uh, it was a highly, um, like communal singing was very dominant and also Nusach that was led by very talented, like lay leaders, I would say, something like that. Um, but from a young age, uh, I, in our congregation, very down to earth and uh, in, in Jerusalem, a Reform Synagogue, Kedat Kornashama, I would play on the bima with all of my friends that are my friends till today. And our noise was part of the sacred sounds of tefillah. And that's kind of what, that was my first steps, literally, into liturgical music and falling in love with sacred music. Um, and I really think that being an Israeli, what I, what draws me close to sacred music is, um, and wanting to also be an active part in, in shaping what that means is um, the role that it plays when when, when we're having a hard time, the human experience, when they're suffering. I grew up in the second intifada and tefillot was the language that went beyond um, things that you can't describe in words. That's where music really touched and healed our souls and um, made me feel that things that um, I think supported me in ways that I didn't find in other spaces. And that's what really makes me passionate about it in Israel and around the world. And I'll just also say that another thing that I've seen here in the Middle East, and we have our work cut out for us um, is that, that uh, music succeeds to build bridges in places that words really fail us. And I'm a student cantor, I'm also a student rabbi, so that's my model. Um, but when I tell Israelis that I am studying to be a chazanit, um, and I think that they're, you know, with their kippah, maybe uh, with the taxi driver who's driving me to campus, I think they're gonna now start to, we're gonna get into a crazy dispute. Um, usually uh, what happens is their face lights up and they say that their uh, grandfather was a paitan or a chazan and what do I know to sing and can I sing and we start singing piyotim together. So I've really felt, again, just to explain um, how much I think Israel doesn't know how much it needs cantors um, and liturgical music. And I also just want to acknowledge cantor Evan Cohen, who's um, a great mentor amongst so many others that are here. And just to say that we're not alone in Israel. Um, with our cantorial voice that's emerging, and um, so grateful for that. Thank you very much. And I read the blog that you posted on the Central Synagogue website about the group that you have for the weekly between Palestinians and Israelis, bringing uh, bringing the the two together in a, in a in a in a in a common in a common bond, hopefully. So thank you for that. And finally, but of course not least, Zoe, um, your your journey so far, and um, you can, if you wish, uh, mention the rather um, interesting ceremony that I saw you did a week last Monday in the grounds of your new shul. 
Um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, so I, I just wish we were all in the same room, A, because there's so many people I love on this Zoom, and if we sang together, it would just be extraordinary. Um, but I'm uh, gonna try and contain my excitement. Um, it works for me well to follow on from Shani because actually Colin and Shama, her community and Finchley Reform Synagogue, where I grew up, are twinned communities and our rabbis were close friends. And so it's not surprising that there's an element of similarity in our journeys. So uh, Rabbi Jeff Newman, who was the rabbi when I was growing up, uh, realized when I was a teenager that I was quite interested in music and uh, quite early on invited me to help set up what was a kind of teen choir, youth choir, a group of young people who were allowed to be part of leading services in a very informal way. And uh, after a short amount of time, it was recommended that I go to a camp in upstate New York, the leadership camp of the reform movement in the States, Kurtz Camp. And it was at Kurtz that I met a number of cantors, and in particular, cantor Ellen Dreskin. And I remember having a conversation and saying to her, what I canter what is that I don't really understand we we didn't have cancers in the reform movement and um, people had often said to me you should think about being a rabbi and I had thought about it but what was this cantorial thing I wasn't really sure and I remember her explaining it to me and thinking that sounds like the best job ever but we don't have cancers in the UK we certainly don't have them in the reform movement. So I'll just continue on my journey, which I thought was to become a physiotherapist. That's what I was thinking of at that point. Um, glad that didn't work out. Um, and it took a while before I went back for a number of summers and each time I kind of felt pulled a little bit more to follow this kind of Jewish music calling um, until eventually I said, okay, it doesn't matter that we don't have cancers that I know of in the UK. And, and um, it was before Jackie had been um, ordained and we hadn't yet met. Um, but actually, ultimately then going to Jackie's shawl um, when I was still a student and uh, hearing her and learning from her, really just, I started to understand that this was something not only possible, but I felt that was really, really needed. Um, I think the British reform movement was moving um, in a specific direction, kind of reclaiming some of the ritual, some of the tradition um, that had perhaps been lost over changes of Siddurim previously. And a new Siddur was brought out in, I want to say 2007, 2008. I was ordained in 2009. And the timing was unbelievably fortuitous because texts suddenly had found their way back into the Siddur that the community didn't know what to do with. And I felt that Nusach was part of the answer to that question. So I think I was lucky that my timing and the timing of the reform movement saying, we might have lost a few things along the way here, we need to reclaim them, coincided. Um, you asked Russell about uh, pitfalls. I like um, instead thinking of them as opportunities, um, but things like uh, being in conversations with people who didn't necessarily really understand what a canter was, what the role of the canter was. Um, often I found myself in rooms where people would refer to the entire room as a room of rabbis, which I could have taken as a, as a bad thing, but actually I just took it as an honor that I was considered to be one of the members of clergy in that room and people just weren't used to saying rabbis and canters yet. Um, the only real pitfall was um, trying to explain to people when I said I was a cantor and that word was so unfamiliar to them that indeed I was not an accountant, which is often what they heard me say, um, which anyone who knows anything about me and budgets knows that would be a terrifying concept. Um, so it took a while for people to just be used to the word cantor. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. So I want to now move on to the, the main topic of the evening, which is is the rise of the female cantor and, and particularly in, in the UK and in Israel. And um, I think it was Dan that mentioned that, you know, Chazanot for, for 200 odd years, uh, as it were, was authentically determined only by men. So I'm interested to know how this is changing and what are the differences um, as, as you see them, perhaps, uh, between the UK and um, a number of you have been ordained in the US. I'm interested to know what you see as, as the differences. Um, and I'm going to go to Tamara first. She is the latest person to cross the pond um, of you all. So Tamara, I'm interested in, in your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, I should start off by saying that when I was ordained a cantor, um, along my cantorial journey, I never thought I would end up here across the pond. Um, but I'm really glad I'm here. 
um, when I decided to move here, it was for two main reasons. The first is that I happened to fall in love with a British rabbi, as it happens. And the second is that I saw emerging a really exciting opportunity in the cantorate here. Uh, I think sometimes one of the pitfalls of the cantorate is that it's a bit ethnocentric. Um, I don't think that the cantorate lives only in America, and I don't think enough Americans realize that. So when I moved across the pond, what I realized was that there's this rich musical tradition in this country um, dating far, far back before when I even got here, when I was a twinkle in my parents' eye. Um, and I wanted to soak it up. I wanted to learn about it and I wanted to be part of it. So the incredible musical uh, tradition of my current synagogue, for example, um, is really ripe for the cantorial input um, and I think one of the main important differences that a cantor can bring to bear, um, that, that a rabbi could in a different way, but not quite in the cantorial way, um, is that the conversation between the music and the text and the history of the various Jewish musical interpretations of certain texts, um, that is specifically um, what we get as, as cantors as part of our education. Um, and so when I came here from the States, I did have a new musical tradition to adjust to, um, but it was still um, a really beautiful place for me to be a cantor. Uh, and I keep telling all of my classmates across the pond that I feel like I've hit the jackpot uh, being here and, and being a cantor here. I will say that one of the interesting things for me has been the difference in Nusach. Uh, so again, I kind of assume that the Nusach I learned growing up in New York was the Nusach. I now know that it very much is not. Um, and one of my favorite uh, demonstrations of that, which I won't do now, is the Vea Hafta, um, which just shows the different types of uh, cant cantillation, the different kinds of trope uh, that we use. Uh, and so it's conversations like those that I think have made my three years in this country uh, incredibly enriching and uh, challenging. Thank you. There was a conversation recently on the Facebook group uh, Life in the Fast Lane about the different uh, cantillation of the brochas before and after chanting Torah. Um, and uh, actually, uh, that is something that you actually did this week because I, I played the uh, recording of your um, uh, of your service this week uh, and I was able to reply. Yeah, go and listen to this. And this is what it sounds like in the in the UK. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Jackie, you're obviously in the Masorti movement. How how in your view is the cantor changing in favor of the female cantor? I'm not so sure it is changing in favor of the female cantor. There is another one here in this country who is Hazan Bex Blumenfeld who graduated from Hebrew College. She's English and uh, but she also had to be ordained in America because there wasn't anything here. Um, I'm not so sure. I think that uh, the Masorati movement would be, uh, is far more accepting actually of males. Uh, you know, it's still difficult to be a female um, and, uh, and be accepted uh, as a cantor uh, in some of the shuls, not in all of them. Um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how it pans out when, uh, when or if indeed any of the shuls decide to actually pay somebody. Um, so I don't know. Um, I'm interested in what Tamara said, if I can, uh, can I come in on that? Absolutely. About the difference in Nusach, because from my perspective, um, in my shul, the Nusach is exactly the Eastern European Nusach that is davened in, uh, in, in America, in uh, mainstream uh, Orthodox and conservative shuls. It's what we use. Reform shuls are very different because there isn't the, the, the concentration so much on, on Nusach itself. And, and the old modes, but uh, the cantillation uh, of the Torah and the Haftarah are certainly different here because of historic uh, uh, reasons. Uh, but, but when you get to the other um, 
uh, cantillation systems, that's the Gilot for the Shalosh Regalim, etc. They're, they're, they're very similar to what you would hear in America because, you know, it's an Ashkenazi, general Ashkenazi thing. Of course, there are always going to be uh, regional differences and differences from shul to shul, depends on the teacher. But that's, I just wanted to come back. No, thank you. I mean, here in the UK and also uh, I think in Germany, certainly we use West, Western Ashkenazi yeah. Torah trot, whereas um, uh, in other places, most notably US and Israel, of course, it's Eastern Ashkenazi. Um, and if I went to Israel, Shani, uh, what, what do you think is the progress of uh, women cantors over there in Israel? Um, I mean, I would say that you can't really isolate the question of women cantors from cantors in general. Um, it seems like uh, the work that needs to be done here is to open a door for the vocation of the cantorate. Mm -hmm. um, Israel is not a very formal society. Try to tell a room is, of Israelis what they're supposed to sing, um, in what key, and in what rhythm, and at what time. Uh, you'll you'll meet a challenge. Even the most charismatic and authoritative uh, figure. Uh, we are um, a nation that likes to sing together around the bonfire. We still do, even when there's not a bonfire. And so I think the formality that I've really learned a lot from uh, in the art of the cantorate in terms of um, being the leader um, on the bima and whatever has to do with the world of sacred music is something that's still foreign to Israeli society. It just happens to be that I'm going to be the first Israeli ordained um, reform cantor or any liberal from any of the liberal um, or you know uh, streams of Judaism over here. It's not because of I'm a woman. I'm just the first candidate that it was at the right time at the right space. I want to be um, honest about that. There were some people who learned in the seminary in Tel Aviv that Naftali Hilstock Cantor Naftali Hilstock founded. And if I was a man, I would love I would love to study there. I think it's a phenomenal school, and he was one of my he's one of my favorite cantorial voices of all time. But it wasn't accessible to me, so. It's by default that I'm also the first woman, and also first cantor. The real story here is, um, again, like I said, less of a formal society. And I want to say another thing about uh, a progressive Judaism having less resources, even can even rabbis. I'm studying to be a rabbi. Um, it's very rare to have a full time job as a rabbi here. So let alone try to create um, a job, another whole job, or try to convince a community to also take on a, contority, a, a contorial figure if the rabbi is part-time, uh, which is one, one of my incentives to merge um, both roles. So I think there's, there's a lot of layers to understanding, um, to understanding this, um, but I could say, if you don't look at the cantor it strictly, there is a, phenom a cultural phenomenon, the cultural phenomenon of piyut, of Mizrahi um, Jews in Israel that are trying to reclaim their their voice, um, that is, you know, that is not the, that it was very foreign and even rejected by the Western ear of the set of the secular pioneers, at the beginning of the founding of the state. The whole cultural phenomenon of the awakening of the piyut has also created a space for paitaniot for women who um, who sing liturgical music in the in public, and I think that's the closest we have to something that. Um, brings in feminine, the feminine voice in a spiritual way, um, in, a, in, in, a, in a different kind of sacred space that's not in, in the synagogue. So I would expand that question to look at different models um, to start to understand what's happening here in, to, in terms of women and music and, and, you know, Judaism and stuff like that. I so hope that was clear. No, thank you. So, so expanding that on, on this on this wider topic of music in services, uh, from chazanot perhaps to folk and and to pop, etc. Um, I'm interested, um, generally. I'm going to ask Zoe this question: um, How often do you introduce new music to your congregation? I, I get a v definite sense from you and from uh, what I've seen on uh, your website of Finchley Reform that actually singing, congregational singing, is quite a big thing as opposed to you know the performative approach to the cantor so um how, how how often do you introduce both singing generally and new music and, and what's your view overall on this um thing that we've begun to touch on on performative chazanot versus participative singing zoe wow russell that's about six questions um but i'll try and answer them i thought you were up to it <laughs> i'll do my best um Let's start at the end. Let's start with this idea of uh, performative chazanot or performative nusach or just performative singing. 
Um, is there a space for performance uh, in the counter? Absolutely. In concerts, there's absolutely space for performance. F from my perspective, as a leader of the service, however you want to describe that, that's never a performance. It, for me, it can never be a performance. Um, it's a communication. It's communicating text. It's trying to provide accessibility for the community. It's helping create understanding. Um, you talked before a little bit about the difference between America and the UK, and I think one of the differences is that we are more generally, we are more uncomfortable singing in English. So we're singing in a language that some people have a lot of understanding of, but others perhaps have less access to. And I think music is the way that we help provide that access. Um, but I don't ever see it as a performance. I might sing a piece of Chazanut, a piece of, of Nusach that people don't know yet, um, where I'm singing on my own, but I really hope I'm never performing it. I really hope I'm communicating the text. As far as new music is concerned, um, I would say that I introduce more new music now than I did when I started. I've been in my community, I'm in my 13th, the start of my 13th year. And uh, at first I was, I introduced new music, but I was careful about it. Um, and I, I really leaned heavily on a teaching from, from one of my teachers. In fact, she's a choreographer. Her name's Liz Lerman. And she um, taught a choreography class to a group of rabbis and cantors, which we could spend a whole time talking about that in and of itself. But um, one of the things she taught us was to turn our discomfort, we were using our bodies in a way we didn't usually, to turn our discomfort into inquiry. And so when I first taught new music, I, I relied heavily on this idea of inviting people not to ask themselves whether or not they liked or didn't like a new piece, but whether it expressed the text or not, whether it communicated the message, whether it gave them access to where we were within the Siddur, within that specific service, whether it helped evoke a feeling. And, and that changed the conversation. So now I introduce music um, when it's needed, I hope, um, and again, hopefully asking what does the community need in this moment um, do we need something new why do we need something new um, just one example and then I'll I'll stop um, when we started having services on zoom at the beginning of the pandemic one of the things I really felt we needed was uh, more settings of Hashkivenu. we were really relying heavily on the idea of needing protection and Hashkivenu expresses that so beautifully, but we didn't have enough settings for it to feel like it was quite fitting. And so that was the first thing that I felt we needed to learn a new setting of. And then we learned a couple because actually we needed to really allow Hashkivenu to become a focus of our evening liturgy. And, and that was the way I knew to do it. Thank you. Dan, what about you? Did you introduce new music often to, to your congregation at Stephen Wise? Um, so uh, when I started at Stephen Wise um, uh, 15 years ago, I, um, I came in and it was an organ and choir uh, service. A.W. Binder was the music director at uh, Stephen Wise Free Synagogue and he was anti-cantor for his tenure, uh, throughout his te tenure. Even though he was one of the founders of the cantorial school, which at the time was Klal Yisrael and they graduated Orthodox reform and conservative uh, Chazanim from HUC. Um, he was very anti cantor. He didn't think that cantors really had the musical knowledge or sophistication in order to lead a service. And he was highly, uh, highly musical, highly trained. Uh, and his, he preserved Nusach through the most contemporary, cutting edge uh, technology of their time, which was the organ and the choir. Uh, and he, and that was that was the cutting that was cutting edge for uh, Reform Judaism at the time. So it was considered very modern if you had an organ and choir, um, you know. And he did uh, oratorios all about Nusach. Uh, every festival had an oratorio uh, composed by him. All of that was dismantled uh, in 1980, well before I got there. Uh, and the first female cantor was hired, Ellen Stedner Math. Uh, and uh, that, she's not the first. I, I want to draw attention to that. Someone mentioned in the chat that uh, uh, Catbird is something we should be mentioning right now, our, 
our, uh, the book by our, our dear friend, uh, the first cantor, Barbara Osfeld, Cantor Barbara Osfeld. It's the comment uh, from Rabbi Gershon Sillins, yes. Thank you, Gershon, for bringing that up. Yeah, and, um, and all of the wonderful Chazanim uh, cantors uh, uh, that are female uh, in the United States, are, it's, it's, they're since then just truly amazing cantors, uh, and each of them with their own unique perspectives and own unique approaches uh, to Chazanut. So getting back to Stephen Wise, um, uh, you know, the music that we have, uh, we were given from there was, you know, it changed into more community choir leading, uh, like once a month they'd have a children's service, once a month they had a, a, a family service, once a month they'd have uh, this, you know, different contingencies. And I think this was popular throughout the 80s and 90s, uh, coming into, uh, you know, coming into the time when I took over. By the time I took over, uh, I, I came in and basically obliterated that past history. So I apologize uh, publicly uh, if, if for what, uh, what I'm saying here. But uh, basically, I had to come in at a time when the when the synagogue was at an extremely low point in its history, that uh, they were at the risk of shutting down completely. And our objective was to completely remake the synagogue, to invent a new synagogue on the west side. Uh, and so I was uh, empowered to remove the, the organ, uh, not remove it. I will never remove the organ. Uh, I still play it for uh, Kristallnacht, and uh, we have actually been doing programs with Prague, uh, with Rabbi Maxa uh, in Prague, uh, with um, uh, my dear friend Ralph Selig, uh, and we, we perform the great works of Louis Lewandowski and uh, great classics, cantorial classics still in the sanctuary, but at their own time and place. And so I do believe in, in raising up uh, the tradition of our European cantorial classics, uh, but it doesn't have quite the same uh, setting in our service the way that I had to, uh, it's difficult for me to transition from a band-led service. Uh, that was my, I was empowered to, to create a totally new modern service uh, based on a philosophy. And that's, that's really where it comes from, is an institutional philosophy. It's about uh, making my musical decisions based upon the philosophy of the organization. So we decided together, me and my rabbi, uh, Amiel Hirsch, uh, we wanted to return back to Nusach, to traditional Nusach. We wanted to return back to a full Hebrew service we wanted to reintroduce Kabbalat Shabbat, the full, fullest extent, nine verses of Lachado Di, all the Psalms before and after being represented, uh, a, a powerful sermon followed by uh, a quick Mariv and, and the closing. But all of the, the liturgy was important to be sung in Hebrew uh, and to reintroduce the Hebrew to, uh, even though it's, it's not the easiest language uh, for Americans, to participate in, over time, if you repeat it enough, they know it, and they know Nusach, and they sing it quite well. Uh, and I, through this process of reinventing the service, that's where much of my music came from. That's why I published my own book called uh, Tapestry of Prayer. And it, that's how I think of it, is in terms of a tapestry, that we can take modern settings, old settings, I have the Tzadi Katamar by Kirshner, I reset in a contemporary fashion. I, I really believe that things in a, in a more modern setting can be accomplished. Old, new, everything together with Nusach, uh, and people can sing it if they come enough to your service. And if it's a consistent ritual, that it, it needs to be ritualized. And so over time, I would say my music uh, was a very quick change from the past and then very slowly changing the music over time and introducing new music and new settings. And I gotta say, it's difficult for me to find settings from the reform movement in America that fit my service. Uh, so that's why a lot of my stuff, because so much of it's in English and so much of it is, is not uh, quite fitting into our philosophy. So, and it doesn't transition well, all of it. But there, is, there are some wonderful things that work uh, but it's, it's harder to make those decisions and for it to fit into the institutional philosophy that I'm following. Thank you. Dan, Dan referenced um, uh, a question in the chat. Uh, 
please do feel that you can raise questions in the chat as we're going along. Um, Tamara, I get the impression that Aleth is a very musical shul. I just get that impression looking at some of it, again, some of your service recordings. Uh, and obviously, um, I, I think I'm correct in saying that, and maybe I'm not, but you're the first cantor there at Aleth for some time. You may correct me on that, but I do know that Aleth is an enormous shul. So I'm, I'm going to ask you the same question about how you introduce new music to your congregation, but I'm also interested what, if, if I am correct about what I've just said, what stirred Aleth to appoint a cantor last year? So we have had um, at least one cantor in the past, if not um, a few. Right? In fact, our um, community care coordinator, um, her father uh, was a cantor as well. So um, Aleth, I, I was lucky to join a congregation that knew what a cantor was. Uh, and as part of uh, the synagogue's commitment to its rich musical life, uh, they wanted to bring in a cantor to both be a fully fledged member of the clergy team. So I give shiurim, I give sermons, um, I do all life cycle events along with um, my three uh, full time rabbinic colleagues, um, but also just to bring to bear some of our um, cantorial expertise around the history of liturgy, um, certainly around Nusach, um, how and when it's used, how Nusach can um, kind of be sprinkled in artfully to um, any service in a way that um, doesn't detract from the musical tradition that I'm already operating within. Um, and we also have a really rich choral tradition. Uh, and I think one of the anxieties of any cantor joining any shul is um, an anxiety within the choir about whether or not the cantor is meant to replace the choir in any way, or whether the presence of a cantor will change the synagogue repertoire in any way. Um, and the joy of my job at Aleth specifically, um, as I've started really building a relationship with the choir recently, has been that it's very much a conversation. It's a, it's a give and take because we all want to um, continue the rich musical tradition that has been um, developing at Aleth for such a long time. And I see myself as a link in that chain of tradition. Um, and I also consider myself lucky that I was brought in because there is an interest in Nusach um, as part of our lay leadership culture and as part of our um, Shabbat and festival culture. Uh, so I really do feel like uh, I'm, I'm lucky I'm able to kind of use my specific cantorial skills, um, but also be counted as a fully fledged member of clergy, which I think is incredibly important. Very good. And um, that, that would be music to the ears of uh, one of our panelists uh, recently. I think it was last week. Uh, and in fact, in fact, I think I've seen him join Asaf uh, relating to the way in which uh, a cantor is a fully fledged member um, of, of the community. I want to hold this this um, uh, subject of Nusach uh, for a second or two uh, and, and explore the importance that you feel Nusach is. And I'm going to go to Jackie here. Um, I mean, what we are uh, privilege to have here are five classically trained uh, cantors, uh, or in one case, almost almost a fully ordained cantor. Uh, and Jackie, I'm interested to know uh, your view on the value of Nusach. Should this week in shul sound like last week in shul? Um, and how does your congregation respond to the way in which you apply Nusach at your congregation? Well, to us, Nusach is the DNA of Tefillah. It, it carries the uh, text. It's, uh, the text is davened. Davening is a Yiddish word, of course, and we come from that kind of culture. And uh, you, it, 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 you can't even envisage having any liturgical experience in, in our shul that isn't carried on the wings of its nusach. Nusach is, is vital, I think, you know, because uh, it tells you, we know from, from centuries of development of it, you know where, what time of day it is, you know what day of the week it is, you know where you are. If you go into any shawl that's davening in this way, you can go into any shawl and you just hear and you can find the page because you know where you are. Uh, it's not a matter of uh, um, interspersing Nusach in it. Nusach is, to me, is, is it, as the DNA. It's the, it's the whole life 
force behind the text. It carries the text. It goes together with the text. The text is poetry. And the Nusach is the poetical chant. So I'm sure we would all agree with that, Jackie. I'm interested to know if you if you use the wrong nusach at the right at the wrong time of the year at your shul, would yes. people a notice and b complain? Yes. Excellent, excellent. I you, hope they would. I trained them. We, we should bring you along to the next time. <laughs> next time we debate who needs nusach or something. Like oh, that. You, uh, you've got me on my. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go to Shani now. Now we, we've we've hinted, just hinted about the indiscipline of of Israelis, Shani. So looking at the Nusach question, if I was to ask you the same question uh, as you experience the application of Nusach uh, in Israel, I'm genuinely interested in this. Absolutely. What what would you what would you respond? <laughs> Look, if you look at the essence of Nusach, something that was very interesting to me um, when I was studying um, at the Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music in New York, I did part of my studies there, um, was to see in Reform congregations Nusach being sung in unison. But to me, growing up, Nusach is actually wonderful for Israelis. That's what the Reform movement came to reform, was this feeling of a big balagan, that everyone kind of does what they want, and then there's one chutzpahdik, that tells you where you're at now. It's mamash, that's your job. It's you, you, you could be, you know, is just telling people where we're at. Um, and that's how I grew up with Nusach. Was it exactly the right mode at the right time? And the truth is, in, in where I grew up, it, it, our situation I learned coming back from New York was not so bad. Um, maybe we didn't get all of the very exciting um, aspects of different kind of pivots in the modes and you know all these exciting different you know maneuvers and things that you could do um and different motifs but it was more or less the mode um but i think to me the exciting thing about nusach for tefillah and for israelis and the relevance of nusach is not really about the right mode at the right time i hope i'm not offending anybody here including dr gordon and dale that taught me about modes <laughs> um and liturgy on the new york campus um but to me the essence of nusach is you know kind of like in in, in an opera is to move things along is to be the glue is to be i feel like sometimes when nusach is taken out of the aesthetic of um current prayer services um then there's something that we're missing in the connection and the transitions and i think that uh, especially, and this is something where it, um, for my, in my training I really take with me, is being mindful of if that component is missing, if that's the aesthetic of the congregation, and I move around in all kinds of congregations, that's one thing I didn't say. My, um, my work is, as a shlichat tzibul here, uh, soon to be a chazanit, is not in, in, in one pulpit, and that's probably how my, how my work will be here. Um, if I know that a congregation likes to move from one, you know, Israeli, um, secular song to a different psalm to a different piyut, then I'm going to have to be really mindful about replacing what we missed by taking out the nusach. Um, and my personal preference is the way I grew up, is to have that nusach as something that moves things forward. And I also want to say that as somebody who's really, really um, interested, and I'm now researching with uh, Cantor Eli Schleifer, a congregation, Keilat Zion, an independent minyan that really brings together the traditions of Mizrahi and Ashkenazi um, sacred music. And that's my thesis, uh, my rabbinical and cantorial thesis. So Nusach is the place where they can make those really, really important transitions to make everyone feel like their identity is represented. And Nusach, sometimes they'll do Moroccan Nusach and Sparad Yerushalmi and Ashkenazi, all intentional in terms of where they're going to land and get the community singing. So I really, I think... My, uh, when I think of Nusach Ba'aretz, I think of going to the essence of Nusach, not necessarily the melody, to create a tapestry, to create a picture that can really bring, make a lot of people feel in one space with a variety of identities, that they're in, in one fila, that they're at home. We, we should um, uh, reflect on that uh, significantly, actually. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and also, um, I'm also reminded that, uh, I think it was a few sessions ago, uh, Rabbi Cantor Jeffrey Schisler um, explained his view of Nusach is, if you go to an Ashkenazi shul anywhere in the world, 
It's the same, Nusach. You should know what day it is, what time of the day it is, and what part of the service you're in, uh, where, where, wherever it is. Thank you very much for that. Uh, you mentioned your thesis there. Tomorrow's thesis was about empowering women's voices in, in Chazanut, and uh, in that she mentions Cantor Faith Stein Snyder, and um, I'm delighted to see that Cantor Stein Snyder is with us, and she has asked a question that I'm going to ask Tamara first, which is, are there different vocal colours and range which give women cantors a new expression? I, I feel like I'm um, stealing Cantor Stein Snyder's words because the chapter in my thesis that I wrote was so heavily made up of an interview that I had with her um, about specifically the ways that um, women can add color and pacing and timing and expression to Chazanut. Um, there is um, a way that you can also accompany Chazanut uh, in a way that um, lifts up the female voice in a different way. Um, I don't want to get too technical about the difference between the male and the female voice, but I think one of the disservices that we do when we talk about Nusach and Chazanut is to say that the authenticity of Nusach and Chazanut um, belongs to the men that it was written for and that um, typically sing it. The authenticity is not in the men. The authenticity is not that men sing it. Women can sing Chazanut and can um, embrace Nusach just as authentically as men. Uh, and through my thesis and through my um, dissertation work and my recital, I hope that I demonstrated um, that women by transposing pieces written for tenors into their range, um, or Dan um, as a bass, transposing pieces into your range as well, um, that we can um, optimize this really beautiful music and find that expression and find those eccentricities uh, and stylistic elements that make Chazanut so beautiful um, and make it work for women. Uh, and so I think that's another uh, really beautiful thing about women training as cantors uh, and exploring cantorial music that wasn't written for them, but doesn't mean that they cannot be um, a link in the chain of that tradition. Thank you very much. I reread your thesis today and it's it's a very powerful work and uh, I'm sure anybody that is interested uh, in, in a copy uh, will be uh, only too pleased from your point of view to, to receive one. Um, Zoe, can I ask you the same question which um, uh, Cantor Faith has put? Are there different vocal colours and range which give women cantors a new expression? I don't, I don't want to speak to something that I don't feel I'm an expert in. And I think um, Tamara, having written her thesis on it, she really is the person to be, uh, to be answering that question. Um, I can say what I think is, is evident, which is um, a lot of cantorial music is written for the male tenor. And when a male tenor sings in falsetto, it's a certain sound, and that's really different than when a woman sings at the high end of their range. So absolutely, you hear different colors, it's different stylistically in, in so many ways, vocally. Um, but I wonder if there's another question about um, the way that women communicate text and choose to engage with prayer. Um, I'm mindful of the fact that certainly in the reform movement, which is really what I can speak to, um, we had lost any concept of uh, healing as part of prayer. Um, really until Debbie Friedman brought in a melody for Misha Berach. And that's not about Nusach, but it is about an understanding of text. And, um, you know, is it the case that women might focus more on healing. It's a huge gender assumption that I really don't love making. So um, I, I'm anxious a little bit to talk too much about differences in gender because I think I could stereotype in all sorts of different ways um, that I don't want to. Um, but I am mindful of the fact that as women have entered the cancerate, I think what they have brought with them is um, a certain amount of compassion um, and um, that's not, uh, if the reverse had been true, if only women had been cantors and men came in, they too would have brought in something extraordinary. Just as we think of, of God as having um, both male and female, um, I think generally if we reflect being made in the image of God, we want our leaders to also reflect that. Um, so I realize, Russell, that's absolutely not an answer to your question. Um, it's just uh, more of a uh, perhaps amusing on why we might need to have um, cancers that represent more than one gender. 
No, thank you. And that, that's a that's a very powerful answer uh, to to the question, uh, possibly to another question. But nevertheless, the answer is uh, is relevant and appreciated uh, all the same. I'm going to ask Dan the same question uh, from Cantor Faith Stein Snyder. Are there different vocal colours and range which give women cantors a new expression? I'm interested in, in your view. Well, um, I was a voice teacher before I came to cantorial school, but uh, and I taught women's voices, but I cannot call myself an expert on the woman's voice. Uh, but I can say uh, that, of course, yes, everyone has a different uh, timbre, a different uh, kind of balance between head tone and, and chest, and, um, and a different uh, timbre and colors that they can, they can use to color texts and, and create um, I think everyone can do that, you know, that, that, and I'm kind of a mimic myself. Uh, I loved studying with Jackie Mendelson. Uh, he gave me a lot of the, the cantorial stylings uh, that, I, that I use today. Uh, I consider him a mentor. I consider, I didn't get into all my mentors. I have so many of them. I study with Bob Abelson, with uh, Noach Shaw, other, like, kind of, I consider the old school uh, Hazanim. Uh, who taught me a lot of those uh, styles, but still, you know, it's not my voice type. I was I was not genetically born and and created in the realm of uh, Rosenblatt or Richard Tucker or the the recordings that I grew up listening to did not resemble my voice. So I felt uncomfortable. I didn't even know that a cantor could be a bass. You know, like that. That's like the world I came from in northern Wisconsin, where I I just didn't know that. So for me. Uh, I think, you know, these, these colors, uh, I'm using them a lot. I shift from my technique. I would be, I'm normally uh, singing in the bass in the choir as an instrumental piece. You know, like when I sang with the great synagogue choir in Jerusalem with Naftali Hirschstick, who I also greatly admire. Um, and I met, you know, Ozzy Schwartz there, and, uh, and we sang together when he was a little yeshiva bucher in the uh, Shtachim. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he dreamed one day of having a mixed choir, and I said, well, why don't you? Uh, and, uh, you know, like, and my just great friends, the Gideon Zellermeyer uh, and uh, uh, Nathaniel Hirschstick, all singing in the choir, touring Europe together. It was just an amazing experience. But I didn't feel, first of all, they, they, would, they would never see me uh, leading as a chazan, I don't think, uh, anything with the great synagogue choir. I was an instrumental, I served as an instrument. I was an accompaniment to the chazan. So uh, I, I don't consider myself, I've never appeared in any orthodox male cantorial concerts before. I've never been invited as a chazan to sing with orthodox uh, chazanim. So I don't feel like I'm in that same realm. But uh, I think that the colors that I create um, are, are just, it's my voice and I go between you know, a voice uh, that, that sounds more like a folk song, uh, I sing pop with 613. I sing, you know, when I'm uh, singing, uh, I can sing kind of a gospel style uh, vocal uh, technique. And, and they're just colors, and I'm, I'm kind of a mimic. So like when I was studying with Jackie, uh, Mark Kligman down the hall said, Jackie, why do you keep repeating things constantly? It's like, oh, I was just teaching Dan. Because I, I, would, I would like start to imit imitate his voice, but it's not necessarily the best technique for me to uh, to be just imitating other people's voices. So that's why I believe people need to be genuine to themselves and their voices and their their selections need to be based upon what they feel most comfortable singing. They have to be true to themselves. Uh, and uh, that needs to be allowed for, there needs to be some freedom of the pulpit. That's what free synagogue means. That kind of freedom to uh, express yourself musically in the way that you see fit and to allow people to disagree with you. And if they don't like what you're singing, okay, they can move on or whatever, or you can move on or whatever. But that's, that's the idea of freedom of the pulpit, is that the freedom to even offend people uh, uh, is important. I want to get, can I quickly get back to, oh, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll follow up later with uh, something else I wanted to say. 
Great, thank you. Uh, when when I heard it was Stephen Wise Free Synagogue, I presume that meant you didn't have Jews, but obviously it's uh, something else. That's Jews with a D. It's definitely not free. There's Jews. <laughs> yeah. um, you, you mentioned their choirs, and I just wanted to touch on choirs uh, for a second or two. I'm going to go to Shani for this question, um, because I, I'm interested to know whether you feel that choirs, and by choirs here we could be talking about anything from a formal group of you know um, singers with a choir director to a backing group whether you think that adds to or detracts from a service and, and uh, at the same time perhaps we'll also ask the question about whether you think musical instrumentation detracts or adds to a service. Shani. Okay these are um, big and important and complicated questions I'll try to give them an answer. Um, so definitely if I was ever involved in, uh, in some kind of a choir um, it was more of a congregational um, singing group. I think that's even what we called it, singing group. We didn't even call it choir. And um, their job, I, I did um, build one of those in my home congregation with my partner um, who we founded, co-founded my ensemble and I also compose and arrange music with uh, Boaz Dorot, who's um, a very important person on my journey. We founded a singing group in Keilat Kora Neshama and um, their job was to be like Shtulim Bebet Adonai. Like, so if we're going to be singing, if we're going to be um, uh, introducing, for instance, new repertoire to answer a previous question, then that was one of our strategies to implement new repertoire in a congregation. And it was Mamash, they were our, um, they were in on our plan and they would help us, you know, bring it. And so we weren't the only ones singing and encourage other people to sing. And I would say that was basically the job of this, of the singing group, something very, very humble. Um, I, I, I'm classically trained. Um, I went to the um, high school music academy in Jerusalem, sang choral music, never sang any liturgical Jewish music there, only Christian music. Um, I discovered the, the phenomenal repertoire of rich um, Jewish sacred choral music in my almost 30s in the United States, which I think is just an unbelievable thing um and i do i definitely have a dream of uh of bringing this i think more in a performative way um in israel and i think i'm again very encouraged by for instance the art of piyut and how much it's been successful because i feel like what it's done for me is not made me want to become a paitanit and sing even though i have also felt i felt i fell in love with many many um Mizrahi traditions and tunes um but it makes me want to connect to my heritage and some of the art forms that are lost here by Aret. Again, for the same reasons that we discussed the challenges of a cantor um, and, and bring that back uh, specifically from the reform movement, uh, the beginning of the reform movement choral music. And, and I think, um, of course, there's an amazing heritage there. Um, are Israelis ready to sing it in their synagogues? I mean, we do have rare synagogues like that, the great synagogue. In a setting that's um, egalitarian, I don't, I don't really see that happening now. But I think as a cultural phenomenon, again, where Israelis meet outside of synagogue, which to me is no, not le no less of a sacred experience. In Israel, you have to look beyond the synagogue to understand anything about Jewish identity. It's not just happening in synagogues here. Um, so I think there's definitely a space for that. And it's one of the things that I am most excited about that I was exposed to. I really think... Um, I can't imagine uh, being ordained as a cantor without being exposed to the, you know, just rich repertoire of choral Jewish music. Um, so I'm eager to, to figure that one out. But we have a way to go before we can implement that in day to day life here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tamara, I think you have a choir at Aylith and um, I uh, think that uh, I've heard it. It sounded a little bit canned during the pandemic, but I'm interested in your view on what a choir uh, and indeed musical instrumentation perhaps also adds to or detracts from a service. I think um, the members of a choir at the heart of it are also congregation members and they are praying. So they I don't see the choir as separate from the praying congregation at all. Uh -huh. I see them as, as members of the congregation, they're praying with the congregation. Um, and I think I, and not having had any experience of the Aleth choir. So I, I started my job at Aleth on April 1st, 2020. And so I have actually never in my life heard the Aleth choir um, live in person at a service before uh, in the way that they are kind of used to 
um, being. And so I've heard um, really masterfully mixed recordings of the choir um, that sound beautiful and that gave me a really good taste of their repertoire. And we just recently in the next few weeks were able to bring in members of the choir for a choral style service outdoors in our sukha. Uh, and I was able to hear some of this repertoire live for the first time. Um, I think one of the beautiful things about kind of post pandemic as we ease back slowly, slowly into synagogue life is gonna be that um, I'll actually get a taste of the Aleph choir. Um, but I would not have become a cantor without a choir. I was a member of a choir growing up. Um, I don't see a choir or a cantor as being antithesis to the prayer experience. I see them as being integral to the prayer experience. Thank you. Zoe, you have something to share there. It's making me think of, of two things that we somewhat covered. Um, one, at the beginning, you asked about um, the difference between the UK and the US. And I mm -hmm. think not to mention the choral tradition of the UK is to lose out something that's really significant here. Um, when I started working at, at FRS, they had two choirs. Um, we have members who have been singing in choirs their whole lives. Um, certainly also growing up with a choir made a huge impact and, and I remember being in cantorial school um, and taking a class that was extraordinary um, on how to conduct a choir and how to involve a choir and being given things in two parts and thinking well hang on a minute what about the other at least two parts why are we only teaching our choirs to sing in two parts and it seemed that there was a concern that what we would have in a choir would be um, congregants who loved singing but didn't necessarily have the ability to look at a piece of SATB sheet music and learn it whether by ear or by by reading the music so for me the gift of an SATB choir to add uh, color and expression and be part of the communication of the cantor is a huge gift and I, I do think it is partly the gift of, of the UK Jewish communities um, in the States, there are extraordinary choirs, but they're usually paid professionals. Mm. And we certainly don't have paid professionals. So, um, and then the only other thing I wanted to just mention, thinking more about traditional uh, Nusach and Chazanut, is the idea of the Mashara Rim, who traditionally were the young men who stood around the cantor and kind of hummed the harmonies to support the chordal structure and to fill the sound and to, to help kind of take the community on a journey. And actually, I think that the choir in parts can be those masharim. I've had to teach a choir to do that. They've had to learn how to hear the harmony that goes underneath the nusach. But when we do that, specifically, we tend to do it on uh, the High Holy Days. I think it has a real impact on the community. So I just would say I would hate the, the choir not to get all of the kavod, all of the respect that it deserves. Um, I, I just I think they're really, really critical in how we create uh, complex musical sound within our communities. Now, thank you. And I'll give an advert at this point to the fact that uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe may, may have been three weeks ago, we one of our sessions was Who Needs a Shul Choir? Um, it's available on the uh, website for people to, to listen to the recording. And absolutely, the tradition of the choirs, both in the UK um, and in other parts of um, uh, other parts of the world, but not necessarily, shall we say, the US, uh, was something that came forward very much. So um, I'm going to take a question from Josh Breitzer. I think I will ask uh, Jackie if she has a view on this, uh, which is, is how has the rise of women cantors affected the range of the congregational voice? Oh, wow, well, this is a biggie. I can see Zoe getting very excited about this one. So I think I'm, I will defer to her. But it's very interesting because women have different voices anyway. Um, we, we have Shlichei uh, Tzibor, Shlichot Tzibor, I should say, women who may lead services who've got very high soprano voices. And then you've got somebody like me who's virtually a tenor. So um, it, it's, you know, you have women with as many differences in range as, as, as men, to be honest. Um, has it made a difference to the congregation? From my ear, I would say no, because what happens is if you have, a lot of people don't like actually the sound of a soprano, I have to say. I have to be honest about that. It's difficult. Uh, some people don't. I mean, some people are quite happy to sing an octave lower. 
uh, but when this, you know, because we don't have um, paid people doing things with us, you know, looking at keys you have to sing in, um, you're going to get all sorts of uh, experiences and different, uh, different um, pitches, if you know what I mean, uh, different ranges that people are singing in. And from my experience, the congregation just adapts. And because of that, we encourage the congregation to harmonize and just to use their natural sense of harmony. And they do. And it becomes like a sound bath. So uh, it, it can be a very beautiful thing. Because, but uh, Zoe knows far more than I do about it. I think you do. Well, uh, Zoe, I don't think you're a soprano, are you? Not at all. Jackie, I was getting excited that you were answering the question because I think of you as often choosing to sing tenor. So I love that you were answering the question. Um, I, I don't have very much to add. Um, one tiny thing, perhaps, which is just that um, I have had men particularly come up to me at the end of services and say, Zoe, you sing so high, which for anyone who knows my voice knows is hilarious. I would choose wherever possible to sing the alto line. I do not sing high with anything congregational. The chance of even getting to a C above middle C is, is unlikely. But what they're hearing is a woman's voice. And what they're responding to, I believe, is not that I sing high, it's just that I'm singing in a woman's octave. And so it's taken a while to convince people it's not high, it's just, it's a different sound. And I think that is part of the conversation. Okay, no, thank you very much, thank you. Um, we've got a question in uh, from Daniel Tunkel, um, who says, uh, along the, alongside the fact that for centuries cantors were men, it is also undeniably true that in both Ashkenazi and Sephardi traditions, the folk singers were often, sometimes predominantly, women. Uh, do the cantors on the panel feel their vocations are in any sense following this tradition? Uh, and I'm going to go back, in fact, to Jackie for this one. I think probably not, actually. Um, I... I don't think, the, I mean, it's a very interesting question because, because the music in the synagogue is really the music of the folk. It's the people um, who create this. Uh, but the vocation being uh, following the uh, female role in, in folk singing, the women's role in folk singing was very often in lullabies and in songs that related to, to women. Preparation of food was another one where women were involved in things like that. Um, here we're talking about the shawl, which was definitely not a woman's domain. And um, I was once asked, you know, who were your role models? Well, I didn't have any female role models at all. They were all men. I had to be because there weren't any women. So um, I think Daniel's question is a very good one, but personally, my answer would be no. Thank you. Daniel does ask some very good questions. Um, Tamara, uh, what, what's your view on Daniel's question? I think it's um, I think it's dangerous to pigeonhole styles of music with genders. I think. I'm specifically coming off of my thinking around my dissertation. Um, you know, I would perhaps argue the other way that if men wanted to also embrace that kind of folk music tradition, that perhaps they could with a similar authenticity uh, that women had. Um, I do think there's so much to what um, Jackie had mentioned about the historical and musical context in which women were writing this music. Um, one of my least favorite uh, terms is happy clappy. Uh, and I think that relates a lot to this conversation around the dichotomy between the kind of happy clappy folk music and the more kind of traditional, authentic, um, you know, hard hitting legitimate music. Um, and I really, really want to push back against that dichotomy. Um, I think that one of the beautiful things about um, our specific kind of cantorial world that we live in uh, is that we can do it all. And I think it's really important, uh, especially as uh, cantors that happen to be women, uh, that we can move from one side of the spectrum to the other um, with fluidity, with authenticity, uh, and with vocal technique as well. Thank you. 
Um, I'll just voice a remark that Asaf Leviton has made in the chat. One should always fit the repertoire to the voice, and women's voices are no exception. Any cantor, man or woman, should go through the vast repertoire of cantorial music and find the music which fits most, <clears throat> or write new music to fit his or her uh, voice. And uh, I think that's one of the strong points that is coming out of, of this discussion today. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, I, I want now to um, look forward into the future uh, and to ask all of you, where do you see the world of the cantor and synagogue music in, say, 10 years from now? And obviously bringing in a number of the, uh, a number of the topics that, that we've discussed. I'm going to go uh, first to Dan uh, on this one. Where, where do you see the world of the cantor and synagogue music in, say, 10 years from now? Well, I, th I guess I want to get back to uh, something uh, Josh phrased about uh, the choral tradition and, uh, <laughs> and the female voice and, and get back to choral music. You know, we, we were looking back at this, um, the last, I think, uh, past this prologue, so, uh, you know, if you look back at how we were framing this in the last 200 years of the cantorate, right, we're looking at a very limited perspective of what the cantorate really is. We're only looking at a small uh, moment in history as the European cantorate, like the, the, great, the golden age, so to speak, okay? And I think that we're already in the middle of a new, uh, of a, of a new uh, era. Uh, and that's, that's just what I believe. Uh, and I believe women are fundamental to that. And I believe that um, I, it's conditioning. It's, it's, it's about conditioning. Most people are uh, desiring uh, food of their childhood. Uh, you can learn that from watching Ratatouille, uh, that the rat that made the uh, Ratatouille uh, and the man that, who's normally a critic, he tastes it and it reminds him of his childhood and it brings back all those memories of his childhood. I think people are conditioned the same way. When I arrived to my first student pulpit at Brooklyn Heights Synagogue, there was a group of girls who came up to me, little girls who came up to me, and they said, you can't be a cantor. Girls are cantors. And I was like, I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. And it's really about conditioning, because all of the past student cantors at that pulpit at Brooklyn Heights Synagogue were women. They were not used to seeing a male cantor there. So. I think when you come from a community in Europe or whatever uh, that is conditioned to hear a certain voice, a certain voice type, uh, that, um, uh, that, that is their comfort food. That's their comfort food. They feel comfortable uh, because, they, and I hear the same thing when they, somebody who grew up with a, a, a low voiced male cantor, they're like, oh, cantor singer, you remind me of my cousin when I was a kid. And, and so they're, they're very happy about those things when they, something reminds them positively about their childhood. So I do think that, um, you know, coming out of this, the big choral tradition is, is part of, uh, I think, where the tessitura of the voice changes. That, you know, we used to have extremely well-trained musicians in New York City. Many of the societies in New York uh, were built on music. I just did a, 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 a a uh, shiva at the Harmony Club where I got married. And the Harmony Club was a Jewish club for German Jews who played uh, chamber music together. Most Jews were just very knowledgeable about music. They could play chamber music, they could sing. You know, A.W. Binder wrote these uh, four part harmonizations of choral music that were produced as the, as the, uh, as, uh, as the uh, hymnal. And for generations, they had those books to help congregants to participate and they could read it. The same thing with Hebrew. People used to go to three days, four days a week of, of Hebrew school, even at Reformed synagogues. Today, you're lucky if you can get them to go one day a week. And so the, the Hebrew literacy and the musical literacy uh, really is, is fundamental to what we can or cannot accomplish in today's cantorate. And so if you have a community that's especially knowledgeable about music, then, uh, and Hebrew, then you can accomplish those things. But uh, it takes a lot of conditioning, I think, that people need to have it repeated a lot. Uh, and I just want to say that the, the choral, that's why I said choral music is part of what set things in a high tessitura. It's, it's arranged, specifically arranged with a bass part, which would be my part. I'm not normally singing the solo part, I'm singing the bass part. I have to back up the person who's the soprano or tenor. So 
So I think choral arrangements are part of what has brought down the, uh, you know, the lack of choral arrangements has brought down the tessitura of congregational singing more than, I would say, uh, the female voice, because I think we can pick whatever keys we want to be in um, uh, these days. And I want to go back, before the, the 200 years of uh, the cantor that we're looking at, it was the Bas Hasen Zingerl. Hey, the, uh, the bass was uh, uh, featured as the component to establish the, uh, the Nusach. So anyway, I'm just saying I think we are in the middle of, a, of a, new, a, a new period already, and I do see that in the next 10 years it's going to become even more diversified, and uh, that's, where, that's where I see our strength. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shani, where do you see the world of the cantor and music uh, in the synagogue in, say, 10 years from now, over in Israel? Um, well, in Israel, um, I really hope that this field will be growing. <laughs> um, I really hope that the genres, the legacy even that I was exposed to, and I really, I want to say something about the United States and the fact that seeing a few hundred um, communities that have a few hundred cantors, many of them women, I don't think I could have imagined um, doing what I'm doing without that. And alongside that, growing up in an egalitarian community where I had an equal um, say uh, or an equal impact on the community as my friends, no matter what gender they had, I don't think I would be able to, um, to break out into this field. So I think that the cantorate needs women because we're human beings, not because um, we're women. And because we're human beings, and when we're trying to um, accompany people on their spiritual journey, which is the most intimate journey um, that we have in this life, um, you know, Shivim Panim La Torah, the more models, the more voices we bring of any kind, type of human being, we'll, we'll be doing our jobs because even my voice is limited in expressing what somebody needs. I, I can't express that at all times. My rabbi even, who I admire to this day, um, so many mentors here um, who helped me in different points in my, in my journey to find my voice, we're all limited and we need, we need each other. Well, we need as many people as we had to, to, because we're in the business of, of touching people, of helping people live this life in a, meaning, in a meaningful way. Um, and that's why Israel, but also the world, <laughs> needs to continue and expand its repertoire. I've spoken here also about merging between East and West and Sephardi and Ashkenazi, women, men, and any other gender identities, any other cultures. I'm going to also say religions and traditions. Being in the Middle East, I, I really feel that we have um, a role here in, bring, in bringing people together. And so... Um, I hope that in another 10 years, there'll be even more representation of all those traditions and, 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 vo and I'm, I'm just going to call them voices in the deepest way possible. Thank you. And I'd note Linda Shiver's comment about the effect that women cantors can have on female congregants uh, as a role model uh, and maybe empowered to, to try it themselves. Thank you for that. Um, Jackie. Ten years, ten years hence, where do you see the world of the cantor and synagogue music in your neck of the woods? Oh gosh, well I'm very encouraged by the um, emergence now within the orthodox world of female rabbis. Um, it's not with that, we're in the middle of a, a controversy, my wonderful friend Lin, uh, Lindsay uh, Taylor Butthart has, has just been ordained as a rabbi. Um, in America and she got the sack from uh, teaching in, in, in one of the orthodox establishments but she's having a lot of support and there are others. In EJOL, my organization, the European Academy for Jewish Liturgy, we are now being asked by women as well as men to give them high level qualification. Uh, we, we've never gone in for ordination, who are we? Uh, but we can certainly, we, we've got world-class teachers from all over the place and we're teaching uh, Ashkenazi and Sephardi traditions and there are more women coming in. 
uh, they see the possibilities and I just hope that will grow you know and it will go you know that it, uh, the, uh, the world becomes more egalitarian uh, as we go on who knows who knows but uh, my main concern is actually the world of the canter at more uh, uh, because people don't outside of the reform movement there are very I think very few shawls that are actually paying as they used to have uh, full-time canters they don't have them anymore and uh, that's the big problem I don't know I don't know where that's going you know, if we can train, we need to train competent and and uh, really good uh, ballet to filler, and and uh, then you know who can teach. Indeed, I if think that's probably what it's. You know, and they'll be they'll be. Uh, it's unlikely they'll be paid, apart from teaching. I don't know. I think in the UK, the the answer to how many full time canters uh, other than possibly in the reform are there I, I think y you could find that it's a round figure uh, unfortunately and that this has been one of the themes throughout our whole series the the voice of the canter as indeed has been training generally and incidentally we've got a number of themes for a, a potential series in next year here Th thank you very much for that Tamara how do you see the world of the canter and synagogue music in 10 years time um I think there's something actually really moving about the role of mentorship and um, the role that that can play in um, the cantorial world. I, I remember sort of bouncing up to cantor Jack Mendelssohn when I was 13 and saying, I want to sound like you one day. And he kind of laughed at me. Um, and then he taught me how to sound like him. And then he taught me how to sound like me. <laughs> um, and it was a really amazing transition that I went through. So I can kind of do everything he most things that he can do stylistically, but I do it in the way that, that I do it in my voice. And my dream is for a little girl or a little boy to come bouncing up to me one day um, and say, I want to sound like you. I want to do what you do. And for me to be able to say to them, I'm really happy to help you sound like you. Uh, and I'm happy for you to, to envision a way that you can do that from this FEMA. Um, and so being part of the, the UK canter it, um, it's just as exciting, uh, and I feel just as able to do that here uh, as I would have in the States. But um, the last chapter of my thesis uh, basically does tell that story of um, me kind of bouncing up to this larger than life canter, um, little, you know, five foot tall me, and saying, you know, I want to sound like you when I grow up. Thank you. And the canter Linda, Sh Linda Shivers has uh, added uh, after I came, more women started to wear a talit and more. Uh, girls became bat mitzvah and the girls started doing as much as the boys so uh finally zoe uh a decade from now i don't know if uh, huc theses have ever been uh, spoken about as often as they have been in this uh, 90 minutes um but i'm going to refer to mine um which was uh, called chazan as darshan and i didn't mean cantor as the person who gives the sermons. Um, I meant the cantor as an educator from the Bima. And I truly think that the um, answer to what happens in the next 10 years is reliant on cantors being able to be educators from the Bima, to be able to teach about liturgy, to be able to teach about modes, to be able to teach about the way that music communicates text. And I think that as long as that happens, then the cantor is in extremely good hands. Um, I, I'm tempted to just reflect back a tiny bit just because I suspect, I, I don't want to speak for you, Jackie, but I, I'm going to speak for me, but maybe also for you. If I had been able to imagine in 2009 or 2010 when I was starting my job that this conversation would be possible with these people, with, with this community of highly educated people, I, I would have thought that, that I, I just would have been so excited. I'm excited now. I would have been so excited then. So I think things are changing already. And I think the future, therefore, is incredibly positive. Um, and that if we can, rather than alienating people by trying to force things um, rather than explain things, if we can avoid that, if we can just encourage people to want to learn more, to want to engage more, to know why decisions are being made, to understand the liturgy, to connect to it, and use music as a way of doing that, I, I think in 10 years' time we'll only have more cantors in the community, um, and God willing, being paid not just in the reform movement. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, our, our time our, our time is almost up. Um, I've actually found this evening quite a moving experience, and not least because I think of all the 11 sessions that we've done, I found this one to be one of the most uplifting. Uh, and uh, uh, I just thank the panel, the panel for that. There, there are some particular comments that I thought were worth repeating. Um, uh, Shani's that women have brought uh, compassion. Actually, I think that was that was yours, um, Zoe, wasn't it? Uh, w women have brought compassion. Uh, Tamara talking about, you know, it's not a dichotomy between folk singing and Chazanot. Actually, it's a spectrum, and we should be able to um, take in all parts of that spectrum as as necessary. Dan giving us a, a thumbs up for choirs that we we really needed that um, two two or two or three weeks ago. Uh, and and Shani saying that Cantrup needs women because women are human beings accompanying. Women accompanying people uh, on their life's journey. So I want to say thank you so much to the panel um, for your time, but particularly your your participation and contribution. Um, I said at the start it was a distinguished panel. I, I'm humbled to have been your moderator this evening. So Jackie, Tamara, Dan, Shani, Zoe, thank you very much indeed. M that's, that, that's much appreciated. And, and thank you, of course, to everybody who has tuned in, not just to this session, but actually to the previous uh, 10 sessions that we have run. Uh, and I'm going to go over now to Alex Klein, who's our director of the European Cancers Association, uh, just for some closing words. Alex. Thank you so much, Russell. And um, thank you all the panellists and everybody that uh, participated with your questions and it's a most beautiful and enthralling evening. I was, uh, I couldn't take my eyes and my ears off anything that was discussed tonight. And it's music to my ears, uh, what was said, because this is the ethos of, of the ECA. Um, if I compare it to, say, football supporters, every, you know, the Jewish religion, everyone's entitled to go and support the team that they want to support. So nobody forces anybody. I don't believe there's barriers and I don't believe there's a big left and a big right and a hole in the middle. I think, you know, all the different types or from the right to the left of, of what people consider the Jewish religion doesn't exist for me. It's, it's all of one. We all pray to the same God. And it's either that we inherited something. So tradition tells us to go to that synagogue or it's because it's fashionable to go to that synagogue, or because we're trying to find ourselves, so we decide something that suits us. It's like in, in a football team, it, you know, you can support Liverpool because they're top, you can support United because they're top, or, you can, or Arsenal because it's traditional, or whatever the, the football team is. So um, take down these barriers, and people can switch in and out till they find what suits them or what they feel comfortable in. And I believe that's um, what the ECA does and will do in the future. I think it's so important. I don't believe in putting into categories, female cantors, male cantors. Cantors are cantors. It's irrelevant what, whether they're male or female. They're doing the job and they're the prayer leaders of the synagogues that we go to or don't go to. And that's our choice. And I think that's the important thing. The nusach and the teaching and the learning is the thing that keeps us together. As Geraldine said, it's the glue that keeps us um, together. And I always remember Geraldine's words not so long ago, and it, I think that's important. So to have schools, to learn, to teach our children, and if it's not broken, why, why try and fix it? I mean, if you can understand that. People are trying to fix things because it's 21st century or 22nd century or whatever it might be, but they're not broken. So why do they need fixing? So uh, as was mentioned in the conversations, um, tradition, Nusach, choral services, the liturgy that people grew up in, that's the important thing. So we have to teach our next generation and we also have to embrace the new music and the new ideas to do what, congregations need or want so there's a happy marriage in both ways so i hope we can go forward with those ideas and i hope i'm talking some sense uh, and you understand what i'm trying to say and you agree with me but thank you so much and we appreciate it and we look forward to a bright and wonderful future thank you 
Thank you, Alec. I think uh, always best to finish a series, <clears throat> uh, never mind a programme on a high note. So uh, we will we will end end there. Again, thank you to all our panel. And look on our website, www.canters.eu, for future activities of the European Canters Association. Thank you very much indeed, and good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.